Good afternoon. Welcome to the B. Thomas Golisano College of Computer Science and Information Sciences. And also welcome to the Dean's Lecture Series. I'm Mohan Kumar, the Chair of the Department of Computer Science. The objective of the Dean's Lecture Series is to bring talented individuals from academia, industry, and the government to share their experiences and wisdom with our students, faculty, and the community at large. At this time, I would like to acknowledge our professional interpreters, Stacy Wise and Beth Harris, and thank them for providing this, their valuable service. There is an attendance sheet that will be distributed from the back to the front of the room. Uh, we would appreciate if you would sign if all of you would sign this sheet, please. At this time, I request you all to please switch your cell phones to silent mode. <laughs> uh, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, John Rissig. John is a 2005 graduate of computer science and the Golisano College, where he made his mark both in research with professors as, as a member of Computer Science House. And during his time at RIT and following graduation, John worked to create jQuery, a Java, JavaScript library and has become inter, that has become integral to modern web development. jQuery is used by more than 27% of all websites, including Google and Apple sites. John is now using his skills to teach others through his work and the field of art history and in his work at Khan Academy, where he previously served as the Dean of Computer Science. And today he serves as the Dean of Open Source. I am proud to announce that as of this spring, John will be adding another entry mm -hmm. to his significant and growing resume as he has been named the Golisano College's 2015 Distinguished Alumnus. <laughs> Today, John will present Hacking Art History for Fun and Profit in which he will discuss how tools he has developed are helping art historians, researchers, and museums, and better understand the data they deal with. John, welcome to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, really, I'm really, really honored uh, both to receive this award and to be here today to tell you a little bit about the, um, the work that I've been doing. Um, yeah, last, last year actually I came here and I gave a talk a little bit about the work I was doing at, uh, and I continue to do at Khan Academy around uh, teaching uh, computer programming uh, to, to young children and uh, all the way up to adults and, and that's something I'm, I'm still incredibly passionate about. Uh, what I was asked to talk about today is actually this is my side project, this is my, this is my hobby outside of work and over the last I'd say about five or six years or so I've become increasingly interested in the world of art history. Uh, it, it's, I find it to be uh, uh, very fascinating. And I think one of the things that's been consistent in my work and in, my, in, in, in different areas that I've been interested in, both even in, in, in jQuery or, or, or in areas like this, is that I, en I enjoy working on unsolvable problems, uh, things that will never have a perfect solution. And no matter how you try, you'll get better and better, but there will never, you'll never arrive at whatever that ideal is. Um, yeah, I, yeah, at least in the, in the case of jQuery, which, which I actually wrote back when I was a student here at RIT, like it, it was, you know, that, that was, I was just trying to improve uh, JavaScript development because I found it to be so painful. Um, so I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit today, uh, uh, take you a little bit through my journey of what I've been doing and how I've been applying uh, or like how I've been looking at our history and how I've been applying my technical skills uh, to what I've been working on uh, here. So I guess to start out is I wanted to first you know, uh, open with this slide here. This is a, 
an image that I think many of you might recognize. Who, who recognizes this image, or at least this artwork? OK, yeah, I, I think you, even if you don't necessarily who made it or where it comes from, I think you can recognize it because it's pretty much on like coffee mugs and t-shirts, and it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. And this is a Hokusai's The Great Wave. This is a Japanese woodblock print. And so this is a, a, a printed matter. It came out about 1830 or so. And this was uh, carved into a physical piece of wood. And it was printed uh, uh, using a, a watercolor-based ink. Now, since this is a print, there are copies of this print all over the world. Uh, just about every major museum has a copy of this print, uh, most likely in their collection. Um, so it is, it, this is obviously very different from you know, paintings and things like that. This is the sing, you know, it's not singular. There, there, there are many versions of it. So uh, very quickly, I just wanted to give a very, very short uh, micro art history lesson on this particular art form. Because this is art form. Uh, I, I was familiar with this image, but I was not familiar with the other forms of Japanese woodblock printing. And when I started to see these images, I was just captivated. I didn't believe, I, I couldn't believe that these things existed, and not only that, but I couldn't believe that they were from so long ago. They felt so modern, and I think uh, if some of you here are, are familiar with like, like anime and things like that, like all the imagery you see in today's modern, especially Japanese culture, or manga, or in comics, or any of that, comes from this, directly. Uh, and, and, it's, and I think it's just uh, awesome. So I just want to show you some images very briefly. Uh, during the uh, during the time period, the, the time period roughly stretches from the late 1600s to the mid 1800s in Japan, and you have lots of different uh, different pieces of subject matter. Um, a lot of it was driven by the culture of the time and uh, by the people who lived in what the city that is now Tokyo. Uh, they were interested in a lot of different things, and generally the people who were living in Tokyo. So one thing I, I'll mention is that. Starting in about the 1600s, Tokyo, uh, then called Edo, was not a big city. It was a small fishing town. And it rapidly became a very, very big city for, for, for reasons that are a little bit too long to get into right now. But one of the results is that there are lots and lots of samurai who live there in the city. Uh, and additionally, there were lots of merchants who lived there as well to uh, uh, provide services for the samurai. And one of the things that end up happening is that you have this merchant class who becomes more and more powerful. Uh, and, you know, and, and what you have here, Japanese book prints, is the culture of the merchant class during this time. It was very cheap. It was about equivalent to, let's say, a poster or something like that. You know, it's, this isn't necessarily high art. Uh, but it was something for everyone to enjoy. So what you have here is you actually, this is actually a depiction of a kabuki actor. So this is a kabuki theater uh, actor. And during this time, a kabuki theater was incredibly popular. People loved this art form. You know, the, there wasn't really, it's hard to draw analogies to modern day culture. The closest that I can come to is that someone like this would be the equivalent of like Brad Pitt of the day. And you know, you would like, you, know, you could go to the theater and watch him live. But again, it's very different from what we now think of as theater in that you didn't, now if you go to a theater, you go there very respectfully and you sit down ahead of time and you watch the thing and consume it and then you go home and talk about it. Whereas this is you go there and it's an all day affair and you rent an entire box and you eat food and you talk and you shout and like all these actors had their fan clubs. And so like people would go and have fans and they'd be waving banners. It was more like a sporting event slash theater event. All right, so it was really, really intense. But people love this. And so like, the, you know, they made prints of it. People wanted to have these and show them in their homes or collect them. So you have lots of these. You know, the, uh, these are all just different, uh, different kabuki actors. And I love seeing stuff like this. So this is actually from a play. And what's interesting is that, and this is the kind of makeup and, and dress that they would wear, and I, when I see these images, I'm just, I'm just absolutely blown away. It looks so graphic and, and modern and, and just, just frankly incredible. And I love stuff like this. You have you know, this man leaping out of the water, throwing a boat over his shoulder, and you have you know, this incredible tattoo across his chest. There's actually a little, there's a demon on here, and there's lightning, and it's, 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 it's amazing. It, there's the level of detail to go into. And of course, you have things you might expect. You know, they have depictions of sumo wrestling. Of course, you have like the great wave, all sorts of nature and fishes. And just to wrap up here, I want to show you a couple examples of some imagery that is pretty esoteric, but I think is really fun, and I hope you'll, uh, you'll be captivated. <laughs> 
so what we have here, so this is a print, and you can tell by the design, it's a little bit different. You have like the little edges here. This is actually a fan print. This is designed to be cut out of the piece of paper and pasted onto a paper fan. So then you would use that. So this is a thing that other people would see. You know, you wanted to show this off. Now, immediately, you, you see this, and it's, it's pretty weird and pretty hilarious. You have a bunch of cats, all right, and they're dressed in kimonos, all right? So already, this is, this is fantastic, all right? We, uh, but the thing is, is that if you look at them, their faces are all pretty distinct. You know, they, they look like people. You know, they don't look like cats. And what this actually is, is that the time in which this print was produced, it was actually illegal to depict kabuki actors in Japanese prints. There was a censorship reform happening. They didn't want kabuki actors being depicted. So to get around this, one of the things depicted is said, OK, well, here are a bunch of really cool cats in kimonos, and they just so happen to look like famous kabuki actors. All right, so now they aren't actually technically kabuki actors, but the thing is that like people who knew those actors could go in and look at the faces and be like, oh yeah, that's Ichikawa Danjiro, I know who that is by the face. But the thing is, is that that was half the fun, is that you have to show this off, you got to show your, your, your acumen, and at the same time, you know, it's a fun puzzle to kind of explore these. Here's another one I wanted to show. So here we have a, a, a man's head. I just want to zoom in a little bit. And if we zoom in a little bit more, we can see that the head is actually made up of people. Uh, so you the, the, the ear is a person, the nose is a person, there's a person there, there's the people up there. The entire head is made up of, a, of, of bodies. And just to zoom in a little bit more, up here at the top, we have a little catfish, all right, in a robe, and it looks like he's shooting like lasers out, all right? So this is, again, this is, this is very, very strange. And just to unpack it a little bit, what you have here is actually a depiction of an earthquake. All right, so during this time, uh, one of the things that was not permitted in Japanese prints were depictions of current events. Now, an earthquake is understandably a current event when it happens. So what you actually have here are the bodies of the people who died in the earthquake. These are the building materials that were used to rebuild uh, uh, Tokyo uh, for, uh, after all the fires and damage occurred. And up here at the top, the catfish, the catfish was actually a common, commonly associated with earthquakes. It essentially, uh, earthquakes were caused by a giant catfish wriggling and causing the, every, uh, the, the earth to be disturbed. So like, it, and the thing is, that, like, so again, this is really weird, but I love unpacking all of this. Like, like this is not just a simple weird image. It's, it's a really complex weird image. And it's, it is fun to kind of dig into this and really try and understand what all is going on. So, at least for myself personally, you know, I love looking at these, uh, these prints. And, but additionally, I would love to be able to own some of these prints. Now, thankfully, they're relatively uh, obtainable. They're, 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 they're uh, available all over the world. And so just to show one example here is that these are a number of prints. Uh, and these came up at an auction. Uh, I think it was about two years ago or so. Oh, it's a little bit cropped off. But it says, Lot 55, 20 Japanese woodblock prints. So this is what the auction listing said. And in there, it said, each depicting a female slash geisha figure with calligraphy throughout each print. Now, the thing is, is that whoever, wherever this listing went up, they had no idea what is going on here. This is about as vague a description as you can possibly imagine. Uh, a, a female geisha figure, I mean, they are correct. They do all have women inside them, the, inside the prints, but they don't know what they're doing, who made the print, what year it was made. Like, none of the actual identifying features of, of these prints. Uh, so that's actually a bit of a problem, because at least for myself, I, I want to learn. I want to learn about what's, what's being depicted here. And, and so they're estimating, you know, there's about 20 prints, estimating $400, $600. And so I'm like, well, that seems awesome. Like 20 prints, $20 a print. That's, that's, that's phenomenal. That's a, that's a steal. But the thing is, like, I don't know. If they don't know what it is, how am I supposed to know what it is? All right. So there are a number of ways in which you can do that. You know, first step is you need to acquire and read a ton of really, really expensive books, OK? Uh, so I have bookshelves now that are just overflowing with books, uh, all about Japanese printing. And I love it, because I love reading them. They're, they're, they're fascinating. But the thing is, is that while I am getting better at identifying the subject matter, 
Um, I'm still struggling with being able to read signatures and things like that. It, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. This is a thing that scholars struggle with for, for decades. Um, now, additionally, I, I need to be able to learn and read Japanese, learn, learn to read Japanese. Uh, I don't necessarily need to be able to speak it uh, simply because like, I, I would be, if I want to be able to read the prints. Now, the problem, though, and that's why there's an asterisk here, is that I need to be able to read Japanese from the 17th and 19th century. All right, so I can't just go and open up Rosetta Stone and be able to and read this. Like, like, in fact, I can't even take classes here at RIT or at other college, most other colleges, and be able to learn how to read this. This is the sort of thing that you can only really learn at like a doctoral level. And honestly, I only know of, you know, just probably less than 100 people in the world who are like experts at being able to read this, this form of Japanese. And they, they, you know, they're very busy because there's so few of them. Now, additionally, on top of this, you need to be able to learn how to read Japanese calligraphy. And that's a whole other thing unto itself. So I found all this to be incredibly daunting. All right? Now, granted, I, it's not to say I won't try to do any of these. I absolutely will. But the thing is, is that like me as a computer programmer, all right, in the world where if I want to learn something, I just Google it and open up Wikipedia or Stack Overflow or wherever, and I just learn what I need to know. Having to buy books and study for years and years and years, all this sort of stuff, I was not terribly excited by it. All right, so I ended up building a, a website kind of built out of this frustration. And it's called uh, ukiyoe.org. Ukiyoe is the name of this art form, Pictures of the Floating World. And just to kind of show you a little bit, so the website, it's a database of Japanese prints. So I pulled prints together from many institutions, from uh, uh, museums, libraries, universities, uh, galleries, auction houses, everywhere, put them into a single source, so that way it was easy to find them and, and, and discover them. Because not only I wanted this for myself to improve my study, but I wanted to be able to excite other people about this art form as well. So you can do all sorts of stuff, like you can go through, and if you search for cat, for example, you can find all the prints that are depicting a cat, uh, and it's, it's, it's very fun. Additionally, I go through and actually translate, as best as I can, a, uh, the text and the artist names, either from Japanese into English or from English into Japanese. So then that way, uh, people in Japan can use the site entirely in Japanese, and people in the US can use the site entirely in English. So this, is, uh, this has been fantastic, because it's, it's started to really expand the realm in which this material can be appreciated. Um, you, what you end up having is that there are lots of really, really great resources about this art, art form in Japan, understandably. Uh, but the thing is that most of them are in Japanese, and so inherently that makes them harder to access for people who don't speak to, or read Japanese. Uh, so here's just, here's just a screenshot of the website as it exists right now in uh, uh, the, the Japanese version of the site. So briefly, uh, there's a little technical uh, diagram here. So this is currently how I have the website infrastructure uh, built out. Uh, so I've, I've probably I've spent a lot of time, perhaps too long, uh, figuring out how to run this website uh, uh, um, well and, and scalably. Uh, I guess, so, so uh, you know, I, at least for the back end uh, of the site, I use Node.js uh, as the back end. I, 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 I like Node.js. I'm also a JavaScript guy, so I'm pretty biased uh, as to uh, what I do like. <clears throat> for my database, I'm using MongoDB, and I store all the search stuff in uh, Elasticsearch. And uh, then, uh, additionally, I host all the images up on Amazon CloudFront. Now, if you're not familiar with it, CloudFront is a what's called as a CDN, a content delivery network. And this allows you to put uh, static files in many servers all over the globe. So then that way, if someone visits my website from Japan, they will access images that are also stored in Japan. Or if someone accesses it from Europe, they'll get images from someplace in Europe. That way the website loads very, very quickly. It's not being transported all the way around the world. So. Uh, just, uh, I've also done a very little bit of, of UI work. I'm not a designer by trade. Uh, but so like one of the things that, that always interested me is that we have all these artists shown on, this, uh, on the front of the site. But the thing is, is that artists tend to create many, many different artworks. Oops, here again. And, and they, so just, just here's, here's Urikawa Hiroshige. 
And this is just a, a random representative artwork. Now, the thing is, like, how do you get a sense for the artist's full body of work? This can be hard to do. So I created a little utility where if you mouse over an artist's work, uh, you can kind of scrub through all the, a, a representative sampling of different types of artworks that they do. So you can see here, there, there's all sorts of different things. You know, there's, and, and, just, and just looking through very quickly, quickly, you can kind of see, oh, that artist, it looks like, there, I saw lots of nature, uh, I, I was water, I saw some birds. So like immediately you kind of have a sense of like, okay, this person probably really likes making nature prints. And you, now you have a sense for that person's, uh, for that particular artist's work. Now, there are a lot of really challenging technical problems in this particular project. And I wanted to talk about a couple of them today. One of the very first problems that I dealt with was attempting to collect all of this data. Now, currently there is about a quarter million prints represented in my site. Um, but the problem is, is that where this data is coming from, you know, different you know, universities, libraries, or wherever, not all of them, but a number of them are, let's just say, very antiquated websites, okay? Uh, that's a nice way of saying that they're, you know, they were built sometime in the 90s, they use lots of HTML tables, they, you know, they're, they're, they're not modern, all right? And uh, so it's not, it tends to not be very simple to just kind of go through and collect this data out. And so I ended up building this framework uh, for scraping the data off their websites uh, to be able to pull it in. And I use this model where I go through and I'm actually driving a headless browser. So, so, this, is, so this is like a, like a normal, for example, Chrome browser, but there's, you can't see the result. It's just kind of, uh, uh, you're just programmatically telling it what to do. Now the nice thing about this is what's called, it's called PhantomJS, if, if you're interested. And uh, so what you can do now is essentially, for example, go to a page of the search results and say, okay, click the first search result, go to the first page, download the HTML, download the image. All right, now go back to the search results, click the next page, download the HTML, download the image, and it keeps going through, just like a human would. It behaves just like a human. And in fact, many of these websites, they probably even can't, can't even tell the difference between if this is a real human versus uh, a program doing this. Now, I, I won't go into this, but this is this crazy pipeline I have of collecting all this information where I'm going through and driving this, you know, PhantomJS, this headless browser, and collecting all this data out, and then storing it in my database, converting it into images and artists, and then correcting all the data and putting it up on the website. It ends up being very, very uh, uh, time intensive, and, but th this is, so far, this is the best way I've found to handle it. And just to show you a little bit of code, this is a, a, a little scraper script uh, that my, my program uses to collect data and this is, actually, this is one that I wrote to actually collect data from my own website. All right, so this is what I was using as like actually just a testing infrastructure because if I, if I could collect data from my own website, then, there's, then it's probably good that I can collect data from someone else's website too. Plus it has the side effect that it makes sure that my website isn't broken. You know, it's, a, it's a good test suite. Um, so we can go through and we can collect you know, the title, the date created, artists, images, all sorts of this information and automatically extract it. And just to show you an example of you know, some of the data this is like a, an example uh, a artist biography that I extracted from a web page. So you can, you can pull it all out, and it can nicely format everything, you know, pulling out the, the English forms of a name, pulling out the kanji, pulling out all these different uh, forms of Japanese names. Uh, I won't go into the difficulty of handling Japanese names today. It could be very tedious. If you're interested in that, uh, come talk with me, and I can give you some libraries and stuff. So I called this particular framework called a stack scraper. One thing you learn is I'm very bad at naming things. Uh, honestly, J jQuery is a terrible name, and then this is just continuing that tradition. Um, so, but the one thing that I really, really wanted with this site was not just a database of prints. Uh, uh, I wanted to be able to do, use computer vision and use image similarity to be able to find prints. So I'm, right now, I'm using this technology uh, uh, provided by TinEye, it's called Match Engine. They're a Canadian company. And they have this really cool technology that allows you to do what's called image deduplication. So given two images, it's able to tell you if they're representing the same thing. Now this is different from like Google Image Search, where you give it an image and it gives you uh, a whole bunch of things that look similar to it, but aren't necessarily just the same exact thing. 
Now, this is important because this can help researchers. And what, so this is an example from my site. So this is a, a print, a, a waterfall print by uh, Hokusai. And now you can see that there are you know, all these other prints at all these other institutions that are, again, as I mentioned before, these are prints, there are multiples of them. So here, here's a copy that's in the MFA up in Boston. Here's one in Honolulu, one at Harvard, one in the Tokyo National Museum. These are literally all over the world. And now the computer vision can go through and say, oh, it, it just completely ignores the title, the artist, all those details, and instead looks just at the image and is able to say, okay, these things are in fact the same, let's bring them all together. So now we can have effectively one canonical record and, and this helps scholars immensely because now they can go and look at this thing and be like, okay, well, this is what Honolulu says, but what do they say at the Library of Congress? What do they say at the Tokyo National Museum? Because one of the things you'll find in our history, and it's, this has really broken my brain as a computer programmer, because in computer, programmer, in computer programming, you tend to deal in absolutes. You know, like, you know, I always say that this, this, this print is by Hokusai. I, that's relatively agreed upon at this point. But the thing is that that's not always the case. For many of the prints in my site uh, uh, that, that I've pulled from different sources, one institution will say one artist, and one other institution will say a completely different artist. There isn't necessarily consensus upon what is being represented. Art history, and I say history in general, you know, the, and I say even the humanities more broadly, it, you, know, it, you have all these things where you know, these are sort of, you know, this is what you, you're determining based off of all your study. These are expert opinions. And so, so again, like being able to compare these expert opinions is really, really useful. <laughs> Another interesting thing about this image technology is that it's even able to handle cases like this, where you have like extra color bars, black and white images, other you know, color bars and stuff like that. It's able to even work around uh, those particular differences in the images. Just to show another example here, this here is a two-panel print. Um, but what's, one of the interesting things that's about it is so so you're able to this two-panel print you're able to find individual panels at other institutions, which is which is useful. But additionally, at this particular institution, they actually put the print backwards. They flip the panels. If you notice, they're in the wrong order. They're walking, and then there's like a bridge there or something. And you can see here, here's another one at the, at the Met in New York. They actually have it in the correct order. So it's even able to work around those particular mistakes. Um, so one other thing I wanted to introduce uh, was, because when you're looking at prints, uh, and again, since, since there are many copies, there's going to be minute differences between them. Now, what I like to think of is that this is like a really, uh, I don't want to say high stakes, but maybe a high stakes version of I Spy. You know, you know that game where you have like two images and you're trying to spot the differences between them? It's essentially that. Um, now, I just want to flip back and forth between these two. Because this is, this is what my, one of the things my software can do is take two identical uh, uh, or two images that represent the same artwork and align them perfectly on top of each other. So then that way you can compare them. So just to flip back and forth, so these are two different, two different artworks, uh, or sorry, two different prints, uh, but they're representing the same thing, obviously. Can anyone spot like, what, what the major difference is between them? It, it's just shot it out. It's cropped. So if you see here at the top, see how one is missing about like an inch of, of print? So obviously, obviously that's a bit of a problem. Um, you know, like the, that, that means that this, what most likely happened is that this particular copy was trimmed at some point and put into an album. This was relatively common. This, this, happened, this happened very frequently. But at the same time, this one could debatably could be a superior print. You have so much more of the artwork being represented. But again, that may not be obvious to you if you only had this image to work with. You know, you can see that there's maybe a little bit missing, but you may not know that it's so much missing from that top. Again, so like again, so like this is the sort of thing that it, it becomes a lot more obvious when you have things to compare against. So another thing that I wanted, and, it, and, and really this is why I built this site for me was that I wanted to be able to do this image similarity search. So like on this site now, you can go in and you can upload an image to search with or use your phone. So in this case, you can, you can take a photo of a, a Japanese print and 
it'll come back with results from all these different museums and institutions or wherever in the world. So then that way, so at least for me, if I wanted to learn more about this print, I would have to go through and read the artist's signature. I would have to figure out what date it was published. I have to, you know, all these sort of details. That skips all of that. Because now all I have to do is take a photo, and then I can say, oh, well, here's a copy of that print in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's by Kuniyoshi. And I can click through and find out what date it was published, and all these things, and then I'm done. I just learned everything I wanted to know. And in the, in the end, I, you know, I used the computer to do that for me. Um, one nice thing is, you know, obviously, I built this for myself to help myself when researching. But now this tool is being used by many institutions uh, around the world, including uh, the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, the British Museum. Many of the institutions listed here are using this to help them, to help the scholars at those institutions do research on their own prints, which is really exciting for me. Um, let's see if that's OK, so one, uh, one issue that's come up here is our, our cases like this. So what we have here is we have a print, and we have alternate copies of the print at other institutions, which is correct. But then we have this one weird case here where this print isn't the same as this one. All right, so it's actually matching the wrong one. And if we look into why, we see what's actually happening is that it's matching the color bars. It's, not, it's matching the color bars from this image to that image. It's not matching the contents itself. So this is a problem. This is one little bit, wooden, uh, bit of trickiness with this particular technology, because it, it's, it's recognizing that these color bars are significant when, when in fact, they, they're not. And so I ended up building a, a, a tool to go through and uh, start to crop these images. So I built a little mobile tool where you can go through and draw little selections around the images, crop out the details, and you end up with these you know, nicely trimmed looking prints. Uh, I've also uh, been working with uh, David Chester. He works at Shutterstock in New York. And we're also starting to develop some automated solutions to automatically crop out color bars and details like this. Surprisingly, there are no open source solution to, uh, solutions to chop, uh, uh, chopping off color bars right now. The only things that exist are stuff you know, built into like different photo software and stuff like that. If anyone knows of an open source solution besides the one we've been working on here, please let, us, let me know. Another thing I've been looking at is uh, uh, this concept of automatically starting to identify the artist of a particular artwork. So, so given a print that you know nothing about, that for some reason isn't in my database, is it possible to figure out what artist created it? Now, it, and so one thing I've been um, messing around with is a particular technology uh, created by Ursatz Labs, which is actually a deep neural network. And what you can do is you can actually feed in thousands of images uh, created by particular artists, and then when you give it a new image, one that it's never seen before, it's actually able to tell you with a certain degree of confidence who made it. So for example here, there's a particular print I fed in, and it's saying with 99% certainty that Hiroshige made this print, which is in fact correct. Uh, and then this is 100% certainty Hiroshige. And so you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's about, in, in my testing, it's about 60% accurate, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, but unfortunately, that's not accurate enough to be an automated solution. It, there's too many mistakes. People would have to go through and fix all the mistakes. So I, I'm still watching this technology. It's just, it's just not quite there yet. One thing I've been interested in doing is trying to find ways to be able to help scholars, especially Japanese print scholars, in their field. And just to kind of show you a couple examples in which that, uh, this has been able to do this, I want to show two prints here. So I'm, again, I'm going to click back and forth. So here are two prints. And again, if anyone can shout out any obvious differences that you see between these two. Face, bag, colors, clothes, yep. Yeah, so, so yeah, there's, there, obviously there, there are substantial differences. But I think debatably, I think we can all agree that these are obviously the same. You know, you know like all the, all the lines appear to be mostly the same except for those key features. You know, you know th that particular crest on the arm, the face, the colors. All right. Now, that's interesting because this is starting to get into the medium of woodblock printing itself. Because what happened here is you have a, a, a woodblock print that was made on a, again, physical piece of wood. And during this time, there wasn't really a concept of copyright as we know it. All right. 
And the way copyright was determined is whoever owned that physical piece of wood held the copyright on this particular artwork. Now what happens is, is that this particular wood block was sold from one publisher to another. All right. So when it was sold to the other publisher, the publisher made some changes. Now this is actually depicting a kabuki actor in a play. And what they did was is that probably the act of person who was playing that particular role changed. So what they did was is they took, uh, in this case the carver, took a physical chisel, chopped out the head of this particular actor, because the actor had, uh, had changed, stuck in a new piece of wood, carved in a new head, and now you have this new actor playing this new role. So in, in this case, you, know, you have all these sort of dynamics being uncovered. Now what's interesting is that the computer vision analysis looked at this, and it was like, well, it, it saw immediately that these were representing the same thing, the same general artwork. But obviously, these little differences are actually super, super interesting. These are things that matter a lot to scholars. Scholars would love to be able to dig into stuff like this and understand why these dynamics are happening. Now, I just want to show you one other case. And again, this is very similar to the previous one. Going back and forth, again, it looks very, very similar. But again, the head changes. You know, they have a different hairstyle here. Uh, uh, the face is different. And again, it's a very similar thing to last time, where, where again, the actor who played this particular role changed. Now again, tr finding these in the wild is, are, are, is incredibly rare. Because the thing is that you're looking through you know, two different haystacks, you know, trying to find cases where these are similar. But again, the, you know, these are you know, uh, uh, different actors. You wouldn't even think to look for them. Now the thing that's interesting about this one is when we look at the signature, so this is Sun, uh, uh, Sun Shou, this is Sun Ko. That's interesting. It's interesting. So this is actually, not only are the heads of the actors different, the artist's signatures are different as well. So that means at some point, someone carved out one name of one artist and carved in someone else's name. And again, we don't know why. And in fact, I've been talking to scholars, and no one knows why this happened yet. Like, why would you remove the name of the artist who designed this print? Why would you put in someone else's name? This is a mystery right now. But what I like about this is again, the computer vision found this immediately. It found, the, it found these two prints and it said, okay, these look very, very similar. However, the names are completely, the, the artist's names are different. And so at that point, because, because I'm trying to go through and fix these records, and at that point, it's like, okay, well, these names are different. What does that mean? And when we start to look at the differences, well, in fact, that is, is actually completely true. One is Shunko, one is Shun Shou. And it, it, I don't, it, this is, again, this, this is something that needs further exploration, but I like the fact that Something like this would have been physically impossible for a scholar to ever find manually. It's two different artists in two different prints with two different actors at two different institutions. There is, there is just no way that one person would have been able to find these two prints and make the connection that they were the same. So using that sort of methodology, one thing I've been interested in is trying to correct the information at museums and institutions. So one of the things I've been doing is actually working with uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and going through their collection and finding cases where they have prints where there is no known artist. It, at least in the records, they just have unattributed. They don't know who did it. So these are all cases in their records where they have an unattributed print. But then when you look at a print at another institution, there is an attribution. So in this case here, they, they, don't, they say unknown. They don't know. But that same print is at the MFA, and they say it's Kuniyoshi. So that's very, very useful, because now the Met could be like, oh, OK, well, the MFA, Waseda, and the Tokyo National Museum all agree that this is Kuniyoshi. I think we can call this Kuniyoshi. And then now they can start to provide attribution for their works, whereas before they weren't able to. Um, so going back to the uh, uh, original example I provided at the very beginning. Uh, you know, I, I ran across uh, I ran across these prints, and I took you know I had a photo of them, and, and so there, there are a couple different uh, uh, sheets here. Put it into my site, and immediately started to find images of those prints uh, in, in my database. So we're able to find that it was in fact by this artist Shante. It, this art, this print was created. These prints were created in 1897. So in the span of Japanese printing, this is a little bit later. Uh, this is actually after Japan opened up to the West. 
And these prints full, sold for $550. So for $20 a print, you know, the, what, you know, roughly $25 a print, or you know, for, for 20 prints, roughly $25 a print. And now, what's interesting is that these prints end up selling for about $100 to $400 individually, all right? And that means, thus, their true estimate is theoretically somewhere around $2,100 to $8,400 compared with the one that $550 is sold for. Now, I will mention I did get these prints, uh, yeah, so, which I, I'm proud of. But the, but the thing is, is that, like, what I find interesting is that I never, I probably never would have been able to figure out the, all this information about these prints. I, and I, and but the, one, the one asterisk I'll have here is that, granted, they're theoretically worth that much, but the thing is that they're only worth that much if you're able to ever sell them. Uh, and, and like, I have really no interest in becoming a Japanese woodblock dealer or something like that. <laughs> um, so, but the thing is that I'm just happy because I got these at an absolute steal, and, and I love them. I think they're fantastic prints. Um, so one thing, oops, uh, so one thing I, I wanted to wrap up with is that I've uh, been starting to expand this particular work that I've been doing into other areas of art history study, not just Japanese prints. I've been working with the Frick Art Reference Library in New York, and they're one of the uh, most prestigious uh, uh, art history libraries in the world. They have you know, just, uh, uh, countless volumes, and one of the things they're, they're known for is actually their photo archive. So this is actually a photo archive of 1.2 million photos of art. So this isn't art itself, it's photos of art. And, and I don't know, uh, did, uh, who here saw the recent movie, The, the Monuments Men uh, movie, or, or, or heard of it? This is like, these were, this was the group during World War II that was going to try and rescue uh, works before the Nazis could get them. Now, and those, and those researchers were using the archives at the Frick, our reference library, to help make sure that they could find these artworks, know where they are, be able to rescue them, and all these details. So again, institutions like these are invaluable. And so I'm working with them, and I'm also working with this, this foundation in Italy called the Zuri Foundation, the University of Bologna. And they have a similar archive, again, you know, uh, uh, over a million photos. And I've been applying the same technology that I was using to uh, uh, Japanese prints, but one of the things we're interested in here is that they have these archives. Again, they're not prints, these are photos of artworks. But the thing is that these are in physical archives. So that means they have, there are physical drawers with physical folders with actual physical photos in them, all right? So the thing is, is that the, the Frick has existed for over 100 years at this point, all right? So during the, the entire course of their history, they've been collecting all these photos and they don't necessarily, when a new batch of photos come in, they don't necessarily realize that there are already records for this artwork. And it gets cataloged separately and gets put into a different folder, and then that's just it. They, they, you know, they get separated through the course of time. So what I've been doing is building tools to actually help to bring these photos and to bring these records back together again. So I, my, my tool has been able to go through and start to, again, find uh, similar, uh, uh, similar photos of, this, of the same artwork even cases where you know, the, the shading or, or lighting is, is different. It's, it's also able to handle cases like this where you have a particular uh, uh, panel that's lar sort of a part of a larger piece. Uh, also able to handle cases where between differences between color and black and white. Also able to handle, again, like this is a, a smaller portion of a larger, uh, I think, fresco. Also able to handle cases like this that are really interesting. And I'm not entirely sure, I need to research this more, but you can see here there's a number of major differences. There, there's, there's differences and it looks like that there's some damage there. Uh, uh, there are some extra crowns up there that have been removed. Now what's interesting is that, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is before and after conservation or if this is before and after being damaged. Uh, so for example, it could have been damaged in like World War II. Uh, and, and here's another example. Again, you know, uh, so you have this whole part of this particular fresco just, is just completely uh, blown away. And again, I'm not sure if this is before and after conservation or before and after being, being damaged. But again, the image matching was able to find these uh, regardless. It's able, also able to find cases like this that are really interesting. So these are cases where these artworks look very, very similar, but when you look at the faces and you look at the globes and stuff like that, you realize they're actually a little bit different. And this is starting to get into, uh, you know, during this time, during, you know, during like the uh, Renaissance of, of artworks 
uh, uh, artists copying each other. And these are actually both copies of a da Vinci artwork. Uh, uh, so there's a third artwork here that they're both copies of. And then cases like this, this was pretty funny. You have a whole bunch of like frolicking little babies. Uh, and again, they look very, very similar, but you see there's obviously some differences. You know, there, there are things missing in one versus another. And then just one last one here. You can see, you can see there are differences in a necklace and face. So finally, one thing I've been doing is, again, trying to find these missing connections here. And one thing I've been interested in doing is actually starting to apply graph analysis. And one, thing I, one technology I've been using recently is Neo4j, which I recommend playing around with. It's a really fun database. And one of the things I've been interested in, uh, in, in looking at here is that we have three different artworks here, or three different records for artworks. Both of these are at the Frick. This is at the Zuri Foundation, all right? So visually, the visual analysis went through and said, okay, well, this artwork is related to this one. And it said, okay, well, this artwork is related to this one. But the thing is that there's no connection happening between these. And if we look at the actual images, we can see it makes sense because they're both parts of a larger fresco. You can see that they, they were just split apart. They're part of the same artwork. It's just that for some reason, they were, they were moved apart and put into different uh, artwork records. And so this is really, really interesting. Because the thing is, is that you, know, you can kind of, if you start to build these sort of graphs out, you can make the assumption out like if this is connected to that, and this is connected to that, then probably there should be a connection here. And if there isn't, why isn't there? Uh, and, and so the archives can start to fix their, their information. Uh, just to show a little bit more complex example, <laughs> this is one where you have four different records Two at the Frick, two at the Zuri Foundation. And again, you have this one is related to this one, this one is related to that one, that one's related to that one. You have, it's going around in a circle. But nothing from this institute and nothing from this record is connected to that one, nothing from that record is connected to that one. They should all be connected to each other. It's a little bit silly. Um, but the thing is, is that since we've been able to start merging these archives together, we can actually start to go through and say, all of these should be representing the same artwork, even though. You have different records for all of them at all these institutions. Let's bring them all together. In the, in the area of digital humanities, where, where this is, where the, a lot of this work is, is happening, one of the technologies that people have been looking to use is uh, the concept of like linked open data, uh, uh, to, 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 where people go through and make their metadata and their records really, really correct, and then everything will link together nicely. Um, I think that is a very uh, noble goal. However, I think the reality is, is that getting all those records correct is really, really hard to do. And, in, and so in cases like using computer vision analysis, you can go through and start to build these links and create these connections without ever having to look at the metadata itself. There, in fact, all these records are, in, are even in different languages. One records are in Italian, the other ones are in English. They, they won't even agree, agree on those basic facts. Uh, so, I, I, want, I want to end here. The, uh, you know, the, there's, there's a, uh, uh, the URL of my uh, UQA site. I've also been writing papers on a lot of the work that I've been doing. Um, and so I have this up on my website. And uh, all the UQA stuff I've talked about today, and in fact, everything I've talked about today is open source. I put it up on my, in my GitHub repo. You're welcome to check it out and play around with it. If you have any questions, please drop me an email. Uh, I'd love to hear what you're interested in using it for. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I'll end there. Uh, I have a few minutes left before uh, four, so I'll be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> if, if we have yep. time for a couple of questions. Yeah, if you have, raise your hand, and there we have a microphone here. Um, How does the scraper work? Like, are you scraping across some specific data set, or uh, like some just indexing some web images and getting the data? So, so the question was, how, how does the scraper work? Uh, working across you know specific data set, or you know collecting those those records out? It's it's hard because it, it's it's different from every single website. You know, you know, I'm I'm collecting from, uh, gosh, about thirty to forty sites at the moment, and each of them is completely different in how they represent their data. And so essentially what I end up having is, is a 
particular model for the data out at the end, where you know, I, have a, I have a particular model for a representation of an image. And, and that, you know, that has all this particular data, like uh, you know, artist name, data was published, title, all these sort of things. And so anytime I go th I step through that particular page on the site, I'm trying to find each of those individual fields. Now all that, fi figuring out where, what, I, what, what particular subfield on the website correlates with that model is all done manually. You know, I go through and figure out, in this case, an XPath expression to map that to that, that particular field. Um, so at least that initial development is painstaking, and it is, it's not, it's still relatively brittle, because if they change their website dramatically, then I'll have to recreate it over again. So yeah, I mean, th but that's one of those uh, things, that's, this was one of the things that's just inherent to scraping in general, is that they tend to be pretty, pretty fickle and breakable. Yeah. Oh. So all this is doing was spare time? Yes. Yes, this is my hobby. <laughs> yeah, I keep busy. <laughs> yeah. This my question is, uh, why MongoDB instead of a different DBMS? Um, so what, your question is, why, why Mongo, MongoDB and not another DBMS? That's a good question. I don't know. I've been experimenting with a number of different ones. And so what, one of the things I'm actually leaning towards, I'm, I'm not completely sold on using MongoDB yet. Uh, one of the things, actually, the vast majority of the data that you see is actually being stored in Elasticsearch. Because like, honestly, I feel like for a lot of what I'm doing, Elasticsearch is a far superior technology. You know, you know, being able to search across all these records, uh, uh, indexing all this, you know, uh, all this material. Um, I'm pretty much, only, at this point, only using MongoDB, or want to only be using MongoDB for just storing like, you know, user account information and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, I could be using like um, MariaDB or any number of Postgres or you know, what have you. Yeah, I don't know. I, I also wanted to experiment and try it out, and it oh, seems fine so far. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Would you be able to talk briefly about the uh, setup for this? So you mentioned Mongo and Elasticsearch, mm -hmm. just sort of a summary of the nodes you have. Oh yeah, yeah. The yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I think I had. Uh, a slide near the beginning. I just want to pull it up really quick. Yeah, this is roughly the, the setup uh, that exists. Um, where, this is the full pipeline for scraping the data. And uh, let me just jump back a little more. Oh, and this is, and this is what I'm, the technology that I'm using to run the actual website itself. Frankly, the technology I'm using for the website itself isn't nearly as interesting or complex. I mean, it's a relatively basic you know, website. I don't even, at this point, I don't even have user accounts. It's like it's it's you know, it's pretty much serving to static pages for the most part. But the, uh, the at least from a technological perspective, the you know, what's going into the data collection and scraping infrastructure is much more complex. It's pretty it's pretty limited. So like right now, uh, at least for Node.js, it's about I think it's uh, just two instances. And I have them running inside, of, in this case, not. So which just uh, uh, distributes the load out to the different instances. Honestly, I may not even need to do that. Because the thing is that I run all that um, with an Nginx cache in front. So virtually every page you're hitting is being cached to a static HTML page. Uh, and I don't know. I, again, like I'm, I'm worried about the worst case, but again, like. The, the number of people who are using this website is still relatively small. I think I'm getting about 50,000 people a month, which in the world of Japanese prints is humongous. And the world of everyone else, it's very, very small. You know, like, it, so, like, it's, yeah, that's only, you know, hundreds of people per day or whatever, 1,000 people. No, I guess, yeah, it's almost 2,000 people per day. But yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. Again, like, I've probably way overkilled the infrastructure. I could probably do this on a much smaller box and cost much less money, but here we are. <laughs> um, No. So the one question was, uh, have I traveled to Japan to be able to look at, look at pieces? So I have traveled to Japan before. I haven't in a while. Last was in 2010, uh, I believe. Um, so one nice thing about this particular art form is that for the longest time, it was actually more popular outside of Japan than it was inside of Japan. So actually, many of the best examples of this art form are outside of Japan. 
And you can go see, like, like right now at the MFA in Boston, they have an incredible exhibition happening of Hokusai work. And in fact, it's one of the greatest exhibitions of his work that's going to happen probably in your lifetime. And it's here in the US. You can't, in fact, the only way you could have seen it in Japan was when that exhibit traveled to Japan. But it came from the MFA. The MFA owns it all. So like, the, again, like it's, uh, this is actually one advantage I, I lucked out that I stumbled into this art form that just so happens to be relatively accessible outside of Japan. Yeah. Oh. Have you ever heard of Artsy and their, the Art Genome Project, and have you ever worked with them? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so the question was, have you ever heard of Artsy and their uh, Art Genome Project? All, absolutely. I'm very familiar with them. I know them very well. Uh, what, a lot of what they're doing is t attempting to tackle and improve the accessibility of especially contemporary and modern art. Um, and a lot of what they're doing is trying to work with you know, dealers and galleries and, make, and help them to you know, find clients and work with clients. Yeah, so I'm... I'm I'm very interested. You know, obviously their work is fascinating, and I'm, you know, greatly respect it. And and they're they're very familiar with with my work too. Um, yeah, I, th I think right now we're just we're kind of working on two slightly separate things. And that, I, at least so far, I'm mostly interested in trying to help art researchers and art historians. But I'm I'm not, and that, I want to say that to the exclusion of dealers and galleries and stuff like that. Maybe someday we'll see. Oh, right there, there in the corner. So it goes to show that. Oh, one more. Uh, roughly, uh, how long has it been since you had the inclination to pursue this to today? Uh, so the question was, how long uh, has it been from when I uh, uh, first decided to pursue this till today? I've been interested in Japanese mobile printing for I'd say maybe five or six years now. Um, the I started building this particular site. Um, in 2011, fall of 2011, I released a version of it in uh, December 2012. So it took me about a year to get the initial version out. And I've been rewriting it ever since. Uh, and uh, you know, trying to improve it and make it better in every way. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's been a continual project uh, uh, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, John. Yeah. You enjoyed your talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to the B. Thomas Golisano College of Computer Science and Information Sciences. And also welcome to the Dean's Lecture Series. I'm Mohan Kumar, the Chair of the Department of Computer Science. The objective of the Dean's Lecture Series is to bring talented individuals from academia, industry, and the government to share their experiences and wisdom with our students, faculty, and the community at large. At this time, I would like to acknowledge our professional interpreters, Stacy Weiss and Beth Harris, and thank them for providing this, their valuable service. There is an attendance sheet that will be distributed from the back to the front of the room. Uh, we would appreciate if you would sign if all of you would sign this sheet, please. At this time, I request you all to please switch your cell phones to silent mode. <laughs> uh, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, John Rissig. John is a 2005 graduate of computer science and the Golisano College, where he made on unsolvable problems, uh, things that will never have a perfect solution. And no matter how you try, you'll get better and better, but there will never, you'll never arrive at whatever that ideal is. Um, yeah, I, yeah, at least in the, in the case of jQuery, which, which I actually wrote back when I was a student here at RIT, like it, it was, you know, that, that was, I was just trying to improve uh, JavaScript development because I found it to be so painful. Um, so I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit today, uh, uh, take you a little bit through my journey of what I've been doing and how I've been applying uh, or like how I've been looking at our history and how I've been applying my technical skills uh, to what I've been working on uh, here. So I guess to start out is I wanted to first you know, uh, open with this slide here. This is a, 
an image that I think many of you might recognize. Who, who recognizes this image, or at least this artwork? OK, yeah, I, I think you, even if you don't necessarily who made it or where it comes from, I think you can recognize it because it's pretty much on like coffee mugs and t-shirts, and it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. And this is a Hokusai's The Great Wave. This is a Japanese woodblock print. And this, so this is a, a, a printed matter. It came out about 1830 or so. And this was uh, carved into a physical piece of wood. And it was printed uh, uh, using a, a watercolor-based ink. Now, Cedric. In which he will discuss how tools he has developed are helping art historians, researchers, and museums, and better understand the data they deal with. John, welcome to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, I, I'm really, I'm really, really honored uh, both to receive this award and to be here today to tell you a little bit about, about the um, the work that I've been doing. Um, yeah, last last year actually, I came here and I gave a talk a little bit about the work I was doing at, and I continue to do at Khan Academy, around uh, teaching uh, computer programming uh, to to young children and uh, all the way up to adults, and, and that's something I'm, I'm still incredibly passionate about. Uh, what I was asked to talk about today is actually this is my side project. This is my this is my hobby outside of work, and over the last I'd say about five or six years or so, I've become increasingly interested in the world of art history. Uh, it, it's I find it to be uh, uh, very fascinating, and I think one of the things that's been consistent in my work and in my in, in, in different areas that I've been interested in both even in, in, in jQuery or, or, or in areas like this, is that I, en I enjoy working on- It is marked both in research with professors as, as a member of Computer Science House, and during his time at RIT, and following graduation, John worked to create jQuery, a Java, JavaScript library, and has become that has become integral to modern web development. jQuery is used by more than 27% of all websites, including Google and Apple sites. John is now using his skills to teach others through his work and the field of art history, and in his work at Khan Academy, where he previously served as the Dean of Computer Science, and today he serves as the Dean of Open Source. I am proud to announce that as of this spring, John will be adding another entry mm -hmm. to his significant and growing resume. As he has been named the Galisano College's 2015 Distinguished Alumnus. Today, John will present Hacking Art History for Fun and Profit. This, this is a print. There are copies of this print all over the world. Uh, just about every major museum has a copy of this print, uh, most likely in their collection. Um, so it is, it, this is obviously very different from you know, paintings and things like that. This is the sing you know, it's not singular. There, there, there are many versions of it. So uh, very quickly, I just wanted to give a very, very short uh, micro art history lesson on this particular art form because this is art form. Uh, I was familiar with this image, but I was not familiar with the other forms of Japanese woodblock printing. And when I started to see these images, I was just captivated. I didn't believe, I, I couldn't believe that these things existed. And not only that, but I couldn't believe that they were from so long ago. They felt so modern. And I think uh, if some of you here are, are familiar with like, like anime and things like that, like, all the imagery you see in today's modern, especially Japanese culture, or manga, or in comics, or any of that, comes from this, directly. Uh, and, and, it's, and I think it's just uh, awesome. So I just want to show you some images very briefly. Uh, during, the, uh, during the time period, the, the time period roughly stretches from the late 1600s to the mid-1800s in Japan. And you have lots of different, uh, different pieces of subject matter.